Hey everybody, we have got a great show coming your way today. Our guest today is a record-setting strength athlete. He's an author, he's a historian, and he's the leader of the Plague of Strength. So welcome yes. to the show, Jamie Lewis. I, Give it up for Jamie. I am the hegemon of history, the people's historian. That's and, awesome. And uh, yo, I'm so excited to be on here. I have got to say, I have had a question for you, and I never knew I was going to be able to ask this from, of you, but you cracked me up because on Go Big, you said uh, something like, I'm a different kind of pastor. I wear shorts and listen to rock and roll. And I was like, do pastors not wear shorts? And also, what <laughs> bands does he talk or What bands is he thinking of? So I need to know, do pastors not wear shorts? Also, what kind of shorts? And were they cargo shorts? Because you got to change them up. It's time to change up from cargos. And also, what bands? Okay, so this is awesome. So the things get, they're filming you over a long period of time. And that got edited. So really what it's supposed to be is that I preach in shorts I listen to rock and roll. You know, everybody wears shorts, but you know, a lot of Sundays I'll just wear a t shirt and shorts, um, the Hey Dudes. But as far as for bands, I am like an old school metal guy. I love Metallica, ACDC, nice. um, my Guns N' Roses. Uh, my wife here is a full, I've got the whole dungeon playlist, but I love metal. I've never been able to Do get you, past I gotta it. Ask. So. I got to ask, because I grew up going to the mustard seed as a kid. My mom would only let me buy like music from the mustard seed back in the day. So I had Striper. Oh, yeah. Oh, my God. I had yellow and black everything for a little while. <laughs> so do you have uh, In God We Trust? Is that in the mix? I've got all the old Striper stuff. Uh, I went to go see Striper okay. when I was really young. I had the yellow and black attack shirt, uh, the To Hell with the Devil shirt. So I've got some of those was, on the playlist too, for sure. That was the best marketed metal, like a Christian band of all time, for sure. Like Amy Grant gets all the credit for being like the crossover sensation of that era, but Striper, what, I mean, they played on the same bill as Slayer. Oh yeah, and, and they were respected as hell. Everybody loved them, even though it was goofy with the with the <laughs> X Men style uniforms and all. And they were super Christian, and everybody thought they were dope. It was so cool. Yeah, I watched a deep dive on them probably about six months ago, and it was amazing how respected that they were amongst other bands. And so that was really interesting because, again, talent is talent. So I, that's yeah. what I say. And, and I think that you can get good uh, stuff out of any kind of music. You know, like I said, I'm pretty well-rounded because I went to college, uh, believe it or not, for music. So I had to tour around oh, cool. doing opera performance as well as contemporary music. So I'm really well rounded. So I'll sometimes oh, so you listen. You're gonna be a huge Iron Maiden fan too, then, if you're an opera guy. And so I listen a little bit of everything. So and I even like a little bit of hip hop and everything. But you know, it's just always in the mix. But if I preferred music, my preferred choice is to listen to metal, especially when I'm lifting. Um, but yes. the only thing I don't listen to a whole lot of is country. So. Uh, it, it's a good. It makes it makes things diverse because my wife would not appreciate metal whatsoever. So, uh, a Bon Jovi. We went to a Bon Jovi concert. She lo she loves Bon Jovi, but that's the limit. That's about what I was thinking. That's the limit where she's the, at. The way it came off, the way they edited you as like the super goody two shoes. I was like, this is a man who's he's listening to Bon Jovi, and that's about as heavy as it gets. <laughs> Although that was heavy back in the day. Like it was an album. Uh, what was it? Ninety nine in the shade or whatever. Like that went hard. And there was some good stuff on Slippery When Wet, you know, but it, it was yeah. it was interesting. So what happens is you get edited, and it was I thought they did a good job with it. But, again, most pastors do wear shorts. It was supposed to be that I wear shorts when I preach. I'm not a typical. Gotcha. I'm not a stuffy guy. <laughs> I listen to all types of music, Christian and secular. I listen to a lot of secular music. Um, but that's what makes you well-rounded. So Yeah, I actually looked sure. up your church because I was like, is this like a Southern Baptist thing where he's not supposed to be wearing shorts? I really like, I was real high. So we made it like a Saturday morning, the ritual of like, we would just, we needed to relax because we were going way too hard. And so Saturday we would start the day by watching go big. And it was just like our thing. And that episode I loved because I had never seen bull jumping before, but I'd read about it so much because the ancient Minoans were talking 3000 BC. This was their sport mm -hmm. and it was, jumping bulls and so seeing that i was going crazy in that episode so there's no shame to losing to a bull jumper that was badass oh it was so cool and we became really good friends and i mean you know through that show because you're spending 
huge amounts of time together. People don't realize that, you know, what you see on TV is a very, just a small snippet of days that you spend, you know, filming these things and spending time yep. together. And it was during the quarantine too. So it wasn't like anybody was out running around. And so it was, you really got to know those people that were part of the show because you're spending just hours and hours and hours with them. So, oh, that's cool. Did you, uh, so the equestrian gymnasts, that's another ancient sport that I've never thought I would get to see that I got to see on that show. So anybody who's watching that or who's listening to this, you must watch this show because you get to see crazy. This is like vaudevillian. That was vaudeville that we got to absolutely. see. Absolutely. I mean, minus, minus the comedy and stuff like that, but it was vaudevillian acts we got to see. And it was so much fun. You guys put so much into it and the, like, I, the polish was amazing. Plus you got to meet Burt Kreischer. The man oh, yeah. has failed forward <laughs> through his whole life. It's crazy. Nobody can fail forward like Bert Kreischer. Yeah, it was it was a great experience. Great group of people. Um, meeting Cody, all those people, they were super awesome. Bert was hilarious. So yeah, it was it was an awesome experience. And like I say Gladius, I, I don't think the TV did them justice. So the horse He's trainers jacked, he too. is jacked beyond what you would believe. I mean, yeah. jacked. And so, standing on the back of a horse, like absolutely, that dude was a beast. Absolutely. I gotta get with you after this and get in t- so I can get his contact information because that's another person that I need to talk to. Absolutely, this is so fun. I never expected to be able to talk to somebody, much less be able to talk about the thing that has me most passionate in the world right now, which is trying to figure out why we don't look like old school strongmen. <laughs> Absolutely. And we're going to dive into that in just a second. But I want you just to share just a little bit of uh, background on your strength journey and and really explain what is plague of strength. So if you can kind of okay. take those two things. And then I also, after that, we got to talk about the whole powerlifting thing. So, but let's hit okay. those two things first. Okay. So my strength journey is I first got interested in uh, getting buff because in a seventh grade at the summer between seventh and eighth grade, I went on a canoeing trip in the Adirondacks with boy Scouts and uh, I got little biceps on it and everybody complimented me so much on my biceps that when I got to high school and I got pinned under 135 on the, uh, the bench test for football, I, I like one rep pinned me, but I was like 125 pounds. So uh, whatever I was, I had never benched before. And um, so I just went ham in the gym after that, just started going crazy. Every day I was in the gym. I started going in on my free periods. I made uh, gym my PE class. I won an award in high school for like be, having the most physical fitness. Uh, we had this test. It was do a pull-up, push-up, dip. Then you can wait 30 seconds. Then you do two, two, and two. Then wait 30 seconds, three, 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 and go as high as you could go. And the record was like 16 before uh, before I got there. And then I think I when I left, it was 27 or something like that. Some kid years later got it up to 56 or some craziness. <laughs> but um, yeah, and so I just kept going crazy. I just loved working out. I wrestled in college, but it was D3, so it wasn't any big deal. But uh, I wrestled 134 in college so because I've always been a little guy. Uh, I'm 5'5". Five, five. And, um, so then after that, I just kept training and I would just find maybe not the most hardcore gym because that wasn't really important to me. It mostly, it was what gym was closest. And if there were two gyms that were close, which one did I like the most? But, um, in Tucson, I had the, the chance to train at world gym in Tucson, which was legendary for having all kinds of old school bodybuilders training there and stuff like that. And that was one of those gyms where you had characters. Um, I'm, have you ever trained in one of those gyms where like there were literal characters in that gym where you just there, we had hat girl in there who never spoke to anybody. She always wore a hat <laughs> pulled low. She was real small. She was like 125 pounds, but she would put 185 on the bar, cross her legs like a man, like cross her, your legs like this and squat one legged, just with 185, she'd do five, uh, five reps, switch legs and do another five reps, never spoke to anybody. And, uh, we had another guy who always wore a surgical mask because he, I found out later he had blown his face off with a, uh, with a firecracker, but he was uh, a chiropractor, a bodybuilding chiropractor. And, uh, so he was weird as hell. His name was Charles. We had another guy who was, uh, he was just this little, and uh, because two sons are very, very white. It was, a. Uh, it was unusual to see a lot of dark skinned people in there, but we had like everybody who was not white was in this gym. And we had one dude who was this little guy 
And he would always scream, power, power, because I'm a tiger, tiger. I still remember this 25 years later. But every set, he would just go, he would just do that. And it was, and then we had the, the other guy was, uh, the d- other dark skinned guy who was, he was, uh, in the Air Force. He was a combat air control guy, bench 600 raw after getting run over by an airplane. Incredible. So this is kind of the environment that I grew, uh, that I was lifting in. And, um, so it was a lot of bodybuilding. We had power lifters in the gym, but they were kind of weird. They didn't talk to anybody and nobody mm-hmm. really, I mean, in that era, there weren't really, it was everybody bodybuilding. You know what I mean? Even the strongman, Curtis Leffler, he was a bodybuilder. Uh, Manfred Horbrill in the, in the world's oh, yeah. strongest man, bodybuilder. So, um, that was just who I looked up to. And I, so that was kind of where I gravitated. Did you, did you have the same kind of thing? No, because when I started, I'm, I, of course, I'm 50, going to be 52 here this week. Um, so when I started, everything was Nautilus. So that'll throw things back a little bit. Uh, if actually, you did free, the, the, free weights, the you were the crazy guy, people. Roger, whatever his name is, he, his gym was uh, the gym my mom went to. I couldn't stand it. But I know Nautilus. So like everything they trained us on, you know, starting even in high school was Nautilus. There was a few times you'd get on the bench, but, you know, things were just a lot different than, and I, I wish I had time to dive down this hole is that, Back when I was in school, the thing they, they taught people, the, the common knowledge of the day was you didn't want to be too muscle-bound. It would slow mm-hmm. you down. It would change athletic performance. Now we know it's just the opposite. You know, We want everybody strength training in every sport, no matter what discipline you are. But so things have changed so much. So we went from when I was in high school days and the racket club in town was Nautilus for the gym to kind of graduating. <laughs> I trained at a squash club in high school. <laughs> so, uh, you know, kind of went from there. And then in college, they had a weight room, but it was a big universal set. There was a bench press. You had free weights for the bench, but no squat rack. Everything oh, was like a Marcy trainer with the multi stations. That, that it was mainly room? like that, except I don't think it was Marcy, but it was a universal. So you could do chest press, shoulder press, all those different things. You um, can get in a great workout on that machine. Oh my God, those things are um, worth their weight in gold. That and the Nautilus pullover. I mean, we can hate on Nautilus all we want, but the Nautilus pullover was that business. Yeah, the, and that pullover machine is still legendary. People, you know, that that's a result producing machine just because it's a great movement to even stretch guys out, you know, if you've been sitting at the we office all, all day. We all need to be doing pullovers. And if you think you should not be doing pullovers, you are the person who needs to be doing pullovers. <laughs> I'm talking into my mic right now just so I can <laughs> emphasize. I cannot emphasize it enough. That pull in your elbows, that tennis elbow you think you have is because you're not doing pullovers. All of your muscles are jammed in your armpits, which is why we all have these fat looking pecs. It's not because, and even like, uh, you'll see pictures of, um, the, the editor of muscle and fitness or, um, or the guy who was the, the huge bad guy in, um, uh, Nate Jones, who was a big bad guy in uh, the last Mad Max movie, they always have their shoulders pulled way back because they all have fat looking pecs if they pull their arms forward. Mm-hmm. And none of us can flex our pecs because of that. And uh, it's pullovers. It's pullovers and not just stretching. None of us ever do anything with straight arms either. It's always bent arms, laterals. And you can see I dislocated this arm uh, in the in my elbow and in my shoulder and trained through it. It was God awful. I, it was the worst thing, but I didn't have money for a doctor. So I just kept training and, uh, yeah, really screwed this arm up, but it's getting close to getting fixed. But through all these things, because I kept, uh, I kept going heavier and I kept shortening my range of motion in my strength journey. Uh, cause I, now I'm like seeing these power lifters squatting with this real wide stance. And I was like, Oh, I could get more weight with that. And I, I saw people, uh, pulling sumo. Oh, I can get more weight with that. Benjamin with an arch. Oh, I can get more weight with that. And I, and I got away from doing any kind of full range of motion, anything. It all became partials and like supports and stuff like that, where I was just getting myself more and more locked up and I kept getting stronger. I mean, at one point I was, uh, I was doubling 675 in the gym on squats with no belt. And, um, but I was still doing that really wide stance squat Mm -hmm. that I no longer think is a squat. I'm just like the sumo deadlift. I mean, I, I tied the world record, a 40 year old world record in the squat with that method. It works, but you will screw yourself up. Your knees will get screwed up your ankles, your hips, everything ends up suffering over time. 
Well, that's interesting. And like I said, I wish I had time to talk about some of the ways. Because I, when I got started in the lifting, I ended up going and just, you know, I, I did Gold's Gym for a while when we lived in a city that had that. But when we finally moved here to the country, um, one of the things I first did was just go out and start buying weight plates. You know, got a bar, got plates, got a rack, and that's how it all started from then. Um, I was one of the very... So you're like a Brooks Cubic kind of guy, huh? Dinosaur training. Well, a little bit. My, my mentor was John Brookfield. I don't know if you know who John is. He's the I, one that... I've heard the name, but the, it doesn't... I'm not... It's not bringing anything to mind. He's got tons and tons of world records, especially in the grip strength. Um, so he does oh, all okay. kinds of grip stuff. So, oh yeah, and he's also the inventor of the battling ropes. He actually invented that system. Oh no, kidding! Yep. So I was like, very cool. What the That's second person cardio. drew to get certified back in the day? So I kind of had that vast thing. I was also one of the guys that jumped on board the kettlebell stuff right away. I went out and bought the heaviest one they had at the time, the seventy oh, pounder. Awesome. You know, and didn't even know what to do with it, but just thought this is going to be like a game changer. So. I've just kind of placed everything together and kind of done a lot. We of totally stuff. went different ways because <laughs> I taught like body pump and body combat for a couple of years, and I loved teaching those classes. They were super fun. But yeah, I was definitely more, way more of the mainstream, I guess, and you were more of the uh, diesel crew style. Well, and you talk about Brooks Cubic. I read that book back in the day. Um, I used to love the old Milo magazines and end up actually being a writer for Milo. Oh, they're fantastic. So, yeah, and that kind of graduated. So it's kind of like a dream come true. That's some of the stuff that got me started in Strongman. I actually ended up writing for them later. I used to have a series there called Foundations. So, you know, I was more of the old school style and buy into the old school because I said going to the gyms and some of the places just didn't really like some of the culture. I didn't mind it, but didn't really think that people were accomplishing much. There were guys in there that were getting a lot done, but then there was just so much, you know, like guys doing, you know, curls in the squat rack, stuff like that, you know. So it's like I finally just said I got to buy my own stuff, and now, I mean, I've got thousands of pounds of free weights and maces and Indian clubs and kettlebells and all kinds of weird, crazy stuff, and so there's always variety. You know, for me – I don't get to, I, instead of the pullover, what I've been doing a lot lately, I'll probably switch back to doing some more pullover movements as I've been doing a lot with the mace, with the shoulder rock. So okay. you get some of that. You're, it's, it's, it's like a side pullover, basically, depending on how you're doing it. Um, mm-hmm. But you are getting that stretch at least, but not as much stretch as you would with a pullover. So I say all that. We could go down the rabbit hole with that, but I, I got to have you tell everybody uh, how did you set a powerlifting record without ever training the bench press or deadlift? Okay, so um, so I at the time I lived in Birmingham, Alabama, and I don't know if you've ever been to Bur- Birmingham, but being from the, a northerner and, uh, and but looking the way I do, so everybody thinks that I'm like a biker or a Nazi or something. Uh, <laughs> that um, I. I was attracting the wrong kind of attention from everyone. And so I would get into bar fights, just reading at the bar and people would just start shit with me. And so I would just end up fighting. So I just would, uh, I would go and get drunk at the, uh, at Barnes and Noble and read books and stuff like that and take notes. And then I trained and that was all I did. And I just was a big ball of hate. And I trained twice a day at this 24 hour gym that, uh, I would do pull-ups and stuff in the morning before work. And then after work, I would go back and just kill it. And I would do, uh, Instead of, cause I noticed when, when deadlifting, uh, uh, like back in the day, I was deadlifting every week. I would deadlift to max. Then I would do two finger deadlift to max. Then I would do one finger deadlift to max. Then I would do partials. Then I would do shrugs. And at some point my back just completely locked up. Anytime I grabbed any dumbbell or anything, my back totally locked up. I don't know if any, if you've done that, but, uh, <laughs> but. Then I realized I, I don't need to train deadlift that much. And then I just kept paring back the deadlift over the years until I realized if I shrugged and did explosive pendlay rows, uh, I never, ever, ever needed to deadlift because the pendlay rows made it very easy for me to pull off the floor. And the shrugs made, uh, made it easy for me to finish the lockout because I would do them from a rack pull, like knee height. And then I started adding really ugly looking... I guess the Chinese do the same thing, stiff legged high pulls where I would just put straps on the bar and pull the bar as high as I could kind of like the fifties bodybuilders did to, or in uh, strongmen to like kind of solar plexus height. 
And uh, sometimes I'd hit myself in the chin with it, but usually solar plexusite. And that made it so I never had a problem breaking the bar off the ground. And I even did that warming up at the Olympia before a deadlift only competition. I, I warmed up only with uh, high poles because I didn't want to break my streak of never deadlifting outside of competition. <laughs> so from like 2010 through 2014 or 20, uh, 2009 through 2014, I didn't deadlift. And then I stopped doing... I reverse grip bench pressed in competition because of Anthony Clark back in the day. Oh, yeah. Hot and, stuff. <laughs> yeah. And uh, the whole point of me competing in powerlifting was just to troll powerlifting anyway. Uh, at first, I was competing because I wanted to prove I knew what I was talking about. Because when I'd get drunk and write, write down these notes, my friends were like, can you just write it into articles so that we can read them easily? And um, so I made a site called Chaos and Pain that got real popular. But then, of course, you have the internet, the online, you know, non-lifters who say you don't do what you do, particularly Iron Garm. They were real heavy saying I didn't know what I was talking about. And so I uh, I competed once and I was like, I don't know, 100 pounds off the a 40-year-old world record. And I was like, how could you guys be this fucking bad at this? So then I just like competed four more times to break the world record. And uh, I would just show up to meets, read and book. And uh, I barely talked to anybody uh, by the uh, deadlifts. I was starting to get drunk. I would just do shots through the deadlift, and then I would be heavy drunk by the end because uh, I hated powerlifting so much, and I was so bored. And also, uh, I discovered the first time I ever deadlifted 600 was drunk. So after that, I just got drunk to deadlift. So you were like the original uh, Chris Duff Duffin method, the uh, whiskey and deadlifts. I had no idea Chris did that, but yeah, Chris Duffin and I are, uh, are, are alike in a lot of ways. I think we have a very similar mindsets. Um, so let's talk about this, you know, just for people that are listening and don't know, and you talk about rows and some of these things, make sure that people know when you're talking about the pen lay rows, this is a very explosive and a lot of guys don't do these today, but it's a very explosive row off the ground. And every time you have to set the bar down and it touches the ground, Correct. Yes. Because I've and watched so people I, talk about rowing, but they're not doing, they talk about doing these rows, but they, they aren't really doing them correctly. And I think this is one of the best exercises that you possibly could do. Can you explain how to do that? Because a lot of guys just think, well, I go and I do heavy rows. That's not what this is. Can you explain what a Penley row is? Sure. And Glenn and I used to laugh about this. We would, because uh, he was in a similar situation where he had no social life and we would just get drunk, call each other up, talk about lifting. And, um, he um he and I would laugh about this because when you do a pendlay row, your setup needs to be exactly like the pull you're going to be doing in a competition. If you're an Olympic lifter, you want the same uh the same stance and the same grip. And if you're deadlifting, you want your same close in deadlift stance. And I like a very close deadlift stance, Andy Bolton style. Uh and, a, and the closest grip I can take. And then you are going to, you bend at the waist and you want your back parallel to the ground or close to parallel to the ground. And then you grip and rip. So you are throwing the bar into your solar plexus and then just dropping it to the floor. There is no negative to this. It is ramming the bar into your chest as hard as possible, knocking the wind out of yourself. You should be bruised when you're doing pendlay rows. And if you're not bruised, then you're doing them wrong. So... Uh, I've seen many, many, even the videos that Penlay's own guys did of this thing were not violent at all. And I asked him about it and he was like, they just would not listen to me. They kept saying nobody would think that they were doing it right. And I was like, but, but you're the one who invented this. And he's like, yes, I know. I know. He, he was like, I understand how people screwed up Jesus's uh, commandments when <laughs> I'm like, I give them, I'm telling people off camera, like you're doing it wrong and they're still doing it that way. And the reason I just want to throw that in there is I always like to have something that people can take away that are that are lifters that are listening to this, that if they just threw that in the mix, it would probably change, you know, make huge, pay huge dividends in their lifting career because it is an explosive movement. So many people don't include explosive movements today because they're worried they're going to get hurt. Uh, they don't throw these things in, and so they're really missing out on building that kind of muscle. And, and so many people want to even train their backs today. You know, we know that every really? Monday, every Monday is International Bench Day, you know, so it, it's it's like I never see guys training their back. And I said, if they would just throw this in the mix, this one exercise, it would be a game changer. Yeah. And I 
uh, just to, to anybody who is of the mind that you should not be training back, train back twice for every time you train chest. Yes. It is very easy to make your chest strong. Your back is one, it like it holds your whole body together. So, and if you can't do a lot of pull-ups, you are not strong. Uh, it's not a matter, like nobody cares how much you can bench if you can't do a pull-up. And I've seen equipped lifters not be able to do pull-ups. And it was hilarious. Like, how? And then they brag about their 500 pound bench, and it's like your shirt's doing all the work. Obviously, you can't even do a pull up, but um, you'll feel better. It, and also, the going back to the explosive movements thing, people need to be jostled. You have got to jostle yourself. The you'll see so many lifters getting injured because they slip and fall, like they're old people. Like we're talking about people who are elite athletes tearing a hamstring playing softball. Then you're not an elite athlete. You are just a, an overly muscular, goofy person who cannot do a simple task like swing a baseball bat. So you need to jostle yourself. You need to do these uncomfortable movements. You need to get in uncomfortable positions and you need to do explosive stuff and jump around. And this is a fun exercise. When you're throwing that bar into your chest, you are making so much noise. I mean, you just <laughs> got to get into it. Stop around the gym like Godzilla, like beat your chest. That's the time to go hype. And mm -hmm. it's fun. You can get other people involved in it. I mean, people get hyped watching you. That's awesome. All right. Well, now we're ready to dig in. We just got a little background. We might have to have you come back on the show because we're, I, we got a lot of stuff to jump into here today. Um, <laughs> let me ask you, what are modern trainees doing? We've already kind of touched a little bit, hinted of where we're going today. What are modern trainees doing that old school lifters didn't do? I mean, this guy we're going to listen to here, Jamie's a historian, and he lives what he preaches. So tell us that. Let's dig into that. Uh, and you know what? Going back to your uh, your television experience, I, I had the same thing uh, shooting for ESPN when I was a strength historian on a 30 for 30. I shot for three hours, and I'm, <laughs> I think I was in there for 15 seconds. But uh, boy, it felt good. <laughs> yeah. But so the I've been investigating this because I've always wondered. I've looked at myself in the mirror and, you know, I'm training, 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 hours and hours and hours watching Rocky movies and doing nothing but push ups and sit ups during Rocky three and then Rocky four. I mean, the amount of work I was doing was crazy. And I was like, nobody's outworking me. So why don't I look like these guys? And I noticed that. One, we've all broken off into these different lifting categories. You've got bodybuilders, you've got Olympic weightlifters, you've got powerlifters. They barely talk to each other uh, and strongmen. And then you've got the grip guys, and then you've got the, the kettlebell guys, and then you've got the, uh, the calisthenics guys. Everybody's all over the place. But back in the day, it was all one thing. And mm -hmm. so every single workout back in the day started with calisthenics, they started with arm swings. They did chest expanders. They did, uh, they did a lot of arm swings, which I've started doing. And oh my God, it helps your shoulders so much. I even do dance, which are Indian, uh, Indian squats and dance and bitax are the, I don't know if I'm pronouncing that correctly, but they're the two, uh, the two exercises that Indian wrestlers do. And they're basically dive bomber pushups and squats done on your toes where you swing your arms back as, and the swinging your arms back is an essential part of this, which I had never done before. Yeah, can we uh, stop there for just them? a second? Yeah, I, I don't want to interrupt at all. I just wanted to, for people who haven't done that, their their entire program's built on just doing the Hindu squat and the Hindu push up. So mm -hmm. the, I like the dive bomber style a little bit better, but a lot of guys, the, the original Indian uh, push up, there's not an arm bend, so it's a little bit different on that. The dive bomber, you're, you're bending down and pushing up. I, I tell people it's like scooping down to eat something off the floor and then you're scooping back where the other yeah, one's a little it's like different. A, it's, it's like your uh, that boat, that boat ride at the, mm -hmm. uh, at the amusement park, swinging back and forth. That's what they look like. But, you know, if you want to give somebody a challenge, and, I mean, your, your knees just above the quads, right above the knees, you challenge somebody to say, I want you to do 15, or 500 Hindu squats. And it will blow them up. It will blow them up. So I'm just, when you're talking this stuff, I didn't want to interrupt, but it's like, man, you're speaking my language. So go ahead and jump on more of that. I love all that stuff. Oh, no, that's great. And uh, so they used old school implements that you that you still use, like the maces and the, and the clubs, which um, they didn't use as much, but they were still popular in those days. But the kettlebell 
on the other hand, which I thought originally, you know, coming up in the 90s, we only heard about it from Pavel, and I just thought it was a marketing gimmick, just like I thought the Indian stuff with Matt Fury was a marketing gimmick because Matt Fury didn't even look like he lifted, and Pavel didn't look like he lifted. I mean, <laughs> so I didn't take any, either of their advice seriously, and to my peril, because, you know, now I'm reading about these, uh, so I'm going back in time trying to figure out where these different lifts came from and why the Federation started and how lifting evolved as it did. And as I'm drilling down and drilling down and drilling down, I came to find out that we had basically three different places where like lifting was modern lifting was established before that you had the Turners and it was gymnastics and the Turners are the ones who the Turner means gymnast, a gymnast in German and a Friedrich Jan invented Gym, modern gymnastics and invented modern weightlifting basically but um as his methods came down they split into a couple of different groups you had the russians you had the germans or i'm sorry the russians the french and the germans were kind of in the same group and then you had the americans and uh but louis attila was the guy do you know or louis durlocker attila mm -hmm. professor attila he was the guy who um who discovered sandow and they traveled everywhere together and he made sandow into the guy that we all know but Professor Attila was a strong man, but before that, he was a singer and an actor. He, they, these people were all on vaudeville. And so they were all, we think of that, we have this thought of them as these professional athletes in the same way that gladiators were, where they did nothing but eat and sleep and train. And, you know, they had these brutal, harsh lives. But these were really artistic people who were into holistic uh, like a very holistic life system that did not, it doesn't translate to the modern way with the powerlifting and the, and the, the weightlifting. I'm sorry. I'm kind of, I, I become less articulate than I wanted to be. But so this guy, Louis Derlocker, uh, he, when he came to America, he turned lifting into an industry because lifters could not pay their bills. So they started selling all these goofy programs that were written by hack journalists that, or like, or just hack writers in general. And they had nothing to do with the way that these guys were lifting. And they got everybody off on the wrong path right away. And so when these guys were doing kettlebells and calisthenics and then really, really heavy weights with no program of any kind other than you have to mix all those three things together and do running and do wrestling, all those things together. Then it became, well, lightweights from Sandow, and it became this from this person and that from that person. And William Bankier had his own gimmicks and because uh, he was competing with Sandow. And so everybody started coming up with these super secret systems, and it got lost in the sauce that there is no secret. The secret is enjoy lifting weights and be an athlete, and you'll grow strong from that. Whereas now we've come to think of it as I want this guy, this is a goal that I want to reach and I'm going to check these boxes until I reach that goal. You know what I mean? Absolutely. I hope you're enjoying the show today. We're going to get right back in just a moment, but I want to share a quick word from our sponsors. The Pressing the Limits podcast is brought to you by ZionMissionaryChurch.net and there you can listen, you can watch messages, you can share your prayer requests. And you even find out how to plan a visit. And also by NeuroPowerSource.com. These are resources for your mind, your body, and your spirit. You're going to find all the recommended supplements uh, from Project AD to all the gear I use, like the Be Strong Bands and Red Light Therapy, all kinds of good stuff. Jump on NeuroPowerSource.com. Absolutely. I love that. I love that answer, and I love uh, where we're going with this because what did the old school lifter? Well, and just let me jump back to this a little bit. I, again, I there was so much to unpack there. A lot of these guys were great acrobats too, and could yes, do handstands. You know, what I'm saying as far as you know, they called it a press up, but being able to do a handstand and doing handstand push ups unassisted, things like that. We have lost that kind of athleticism today when we talk about lifting. If we were say to go in the gym, and that, CrossFit's brought some of that back. But as a whole, I mean, these guys were, they were just good at, at everything. You know, they did a little bit of everything. And that's what I thought was so interesting. And they had to be. Mm -hmm. Yes, exactly. Good at everything. 
And so they, they competed just for one reason. It was not to prove that they were the strongest. It was so that they could get a manager. And if they won competitions, they could get a manager and then they could make money because their manager would then pay this writer to make these stupid programs and they would sell money that way. And they would sell these boudoir photos and stuff like that. But, um, but yeah, like you said, they had to be good at everything and they had to be artists and performers and they were all artists and performers. And that is what we've stopped realizing that this is an art. It is not a science. We've even, we've even broken the word program. So it, you, they used to be called training routines or workout routines or workout courses or training courses, but program wasn't used very often. It was an old timey word that kind of got picked up again in the last 20 years. Did you notice that? Yeah. People are really, you know, everybody's got a program today. Everybody, everybody who's everybody, you know, who's ever lifted weights now because of social media can sell their program, you know. So anybody that's been to a gym is promoting a program. And it's and I think the biggest thing we lose is this, and I, I don't want to get too much off track. We focus so much on the program that we miss the process of what is happening. That that yep. The process is about building people. You lift weights not just to look a certain way or to be able to do a couple things. You lift weights, it's a part of about who you're becoming. And, you know, that's why we talk about, um, to me, the basement when I'm down there in, in the gym, that's like church to me too. That's kind of a place where I'm building not just muscle, but I'm building my spirit. You know, I'm building mental strength and mental capacity. And so it's this whole idea of, of what are you becoming in the process? Because what happens is people say, all right, I'm doing this six-week program all right, now I'm on to the next six-week program. Now I'm on to the next transformation. When really, you know, we're missing the the process. Who do you want to become throughout this? What do you want to become throughout the process? That's the question I think people kind of need to look at is, why am I doing what I'm doing? You know? Exactly. There's no mindfulness in following a program. There's no thought. There's no, it's just, you're basically purchasing an excuse to fail is what you're doing. Well, I had the perfect program and it failed me. And that's why you don't look the way you want, or that's why it's not the level of effort you put in. And, but when I came at it and I was like, there literally nobody can put in more effort than I did. I, you know, I'm doing pushups, doing sit-ups, lifting two hours a day, and then doing the pushups and sit-ups and running on top of that. And I still don't have this physique. There has to be something that I'm missing that I'm doing wrong. And so modern trainees go at it and they say, well, it's genetics. A oh, God. Oh, that is such a fundamental misunderstanding of genetics that at some point you need to have a geneticist on to explain to lifters what genetics actually are. But you can't have a genetic predisposition towards being muscular. What you have is parents who are probably already large and have hearty appetites who are going to raise another large kid with a hearty appetite because they feed them the right food and they encourage them to exercise. And like these old time strongmen were all or wrestlers. Half of the wrestlers in France were called Les Bouchers because their parents were all butchers and they became butchers. And so they were filled with meat and they got to lift a lot of random stuff because they, you know, they had to be carrying around half a carcass all the time. And so they were jacked and they were used to using their hands and, you know, cutting and stuff like that. So they had crazy grip strength. And then when they would go and they would walk into a gym like Professor Krajewski's gym in St. Petersburg, and this man would show them some calisthenics and then put a kettlebell in their hand, that it was over. Like they couldn't lose because they were used to doing all this hard labor. They had all the diet, like, and they didn't have diets. What they had was the knowledge they needed to eat meat if they wanted to, if they wanted to grow strong and a taste for it and a source for it. And then they just applied all those things together. And usually it was with a 72 pound, uh, a 72 pound kettlebell that most of the work got done with those guys back in the day. I don't, that, which I thought was great that that was your first kettlebell. It's the perfect weight by from all of the old school guys. Hacken Schmidt through everybody says 72 pound kettlebell. Yeah, I picked that. I had this like, you know, and I, I just jumped in. I could only afford one at the time. So I picked up the, the most expensive one they were offering at the time. That was a regular kettlebell. And before that, I'd actually made my own 
with, I, I went to a welder and had him make me a kettlebell handle. And I was putting weights on that and doing crazy stuff, but I was getting so banged up doing some of the stupid stuff like snatches. Snatches are awesome, but doing that with a plate loaded, you know, it was about ready to break my form into, oh, yeah, you know, I was doing yeah. the. You're going to put a hole in the ceiling or the floor or yourself. Because it was much bigger, it was much longer than a regular kettlebell, but because of the handle wide. But, but all I say is this, you know, we look at some of this stuff too, you're talking about what they did. You know, it was a it was a product of who they were and what they did as as people, not just their programs. You know, as somebody who's written books and I've I've written programs, you write programs, uh, but they're I wouldn't call them the books. But in my programs, one of the things I always tell people is like, you need to make it your own. These are guidelines for you to do. We're, we're, I'd like you to implement these exercises. I would like you to implement the sequence. But the idea is for you to make it your own. And that's what's yes. what we're missing today is because it's people want to jumping off. Yes. Everybody wants everything done for them, the exact amount of reps, all these different things. Well, everybody's a little bit different. You know, I, I get this question a lot, like, well, how many sets should I do? Well, it depends on the day. It depends on, you know, what you can handle. It depends on where you want to go or what you're trying to transform into. It depends on, you know, what other sports you're involved in. All these things come into play. And, and that's the one thing I wish, you know, that people would be able to do more today is to say, hey, I'm, I might be doing this program or I might be involved in this diet or this discipline, but you've got to make it your own. It's got to become a part of you. Yes. Otherwise, you're just trying to become a carbon copy of somebody else, which you'll never be able to do because you have no. your own unique things. And and so that's all I want to say. Enough rants about programs, but that, that's where I'm coming from. And and kind of talk about that. What were the programs oh, of Old Time I, Strongman? Okay. Well, uh, so they didn't follow programs, but I do have their training methods because uh, I thought that they were very fun in how they how simple they were. I also did want to mention that Louis Attila, or Attila, Professor Attila, was the guy who invented progressive overload, and he the way he did it was that Old Time Strongman used these huge globe barbells we've all seen them those mm -hmm. big bells on the end and they were all empty uh so they they would just but you know the average person couldn't lift them maybe they were 170 pounds but they were all empty and so they were lifting these things and saying they were 500 pounds or 400 pounds or whatever and they were all lying and he realized that if he just put some like uh some random metal bits in it or whatever he could add a little weight and then he could get a little stronger over time and then thought of the old Milo of Croton, mm -hmm. you know, carrying a bowl around the arena thing. And he put those two things together as a marketing gimmick to sell his training techniques because his gym went out of business over and over and over again throughout his life. And um, so that was picked up by other people, other marketers and carried forward. But the funny thing about that is that Milo of Croton was not remembered. He was a great wrestler and he was very strong, but his legend is remembered as a tale of hubris. He is a cautionary tale because the way he died was he thought that he was so strong that he couldn't be stopped. And he was trying to like rip a stump out of the ground or something like that. And he got his hands caught in the stump and he was eaten by wild dogs. So oh, man. this is why you got to have a historian. Yeah, that's the tale of Milo. And so these uh, so when you're when you're going back and looking at these people, just remember these are actors and bullshit artists and grifters and uh, you know thieves, and they were the lowest class of society, or they were asshole aristocrats, but there was nothing in between. Um, so the uh, the old time strongman we have, um, Pyotr uh, Krylo, uh, Krylov. Uh, he was the king of the kettlebells. The dude was 5'5", 193, and had 18-inch biceps. And this was before refrigeration. He lived in Russia. And that is a crazy size to be, 5'5", 193, pre-steroids. This is years, and he lived 1871 to 1933. So uh, the guy was able to do a, a dumbbell iron cross with 100 pounds. Have you ever done a dumbbell iron cross? Do you know what it is? Well, I do an iron cross with heavy crosses, um, they're, okay. four, they're only, but they're only 40 pounds steel crosses, but I, I do that. And I used to hang my wife from my neck while I was doing it, but yeah, it's a cool lift. Oh shit. It's a cool oh, lift. See, he did, uh, it was with 50 pounds in each hand. So, uh, that damn, you're right on, you're right on the money with that man. 
But so to anybody who doesn't know what it is, you start in a squat position with your arms held parallel to the ground with the weights in them. And then as you stand up, you expand your arms out to the side. Correct? Is that how you do them still? Well, no, I do it a little different. It's a little more showier. I just start out with my arms at my side. So, oh, okay. Because because I've got all that weight coming down, pulling me forward. So I'm able to use the crosses to push me backwards. So there's a little different oh, okay. technique, but the idea of holding something out at the side at arm's length, it's the same concept. It's not exactly the way that they did it, but I'm very familiar okay. with the lift. That's dope. So um, so this guy, he performed until he was 60 and at his peak at 42, which is crazy because these people didn't live that long back then, but all these lifters did. Uh, he would start, he would wake up, he would uh, do 10 minutes of just deep breathing outside. Then he would do chest expanders from all angles, just moving his arms all over the place to kind of get limbered up. Then he would do no more than 100 push-ups, which I found crazy because I was like, 100 push-ups? Like, that's your first clip of push-ups. Like, that's it. But uh, he would do that on palms or fingers. Then he would do a 12 to 18 minute run, which um, me being a disciple of Bruce Lee, uh, I was very big on doing three mile runs every day in 18 to 21 minutes. So I'm assuming he was running a seven minute uh, or six, seven minute pace, uh, doing two to three miles. Then he did frog jumps, short jumps on his toes in a deep squat. So, um, I don't know, frog hops, I guess is what those would be. Uh, I wonder, I don't really know what the difference of frog jumps and short frog jumps and short jumps on toes. Do you have any idea? I have no idea. All right. Uh, then he would eat uh, and go for a walk. And then he would have nothing in the afternoon unless he was performing, in which case they performed for about 15 minutes at a time, maybe up to five times a day. And uh, they would do it in a music hall or in a vaudeville hall or a saloon or something like that. So this is a raucous crowd who's throwing stuff at you. Yeah. <laughs> They're drunk as hell on single distilled liquor, which is just horrifies me. I mean, I uh, the hangover you get from triple distilled is horrific. Single distilled, my God. They could only work four days a week because of their Monday morning hangovers. But uh, so two hours after dinner, he would have his heavy workout. He would do a uh, clean and press uh, with with a uh, an 80 kg barbell, or he would clean and jerk heavy kettlebells. Then he would press uh, 32 kg kettlebells for five sets of 10. He would squat 176 for five sets of 20. He would run the stairs with his partner on his back. And he would do curls five sets of 10 with two 20-pound dumbbells held in, in one hand. So he would do one set with two, two dumbbells and then do the other side. I've done that with kettlebells, and I love it. Have you ever tried that? I've done it with some really light kettlebells because it's like a drag curl, almost the way it sits, the way how it's hanging below. So yeah, there's it's definitely some different activation you get from that for sure. Yeah, and you can do them with really light uh, kettlebells and do hammer curls that way too to mm -hmm. work your grip strength and your brachialis, and um, and I think that's awesome too. They were uh, just I, I'll only talk about one or two more. Uh, Edward Aston, he had a bunch of records like the bent press. Uh, he would just do a long AM and PM walk. And then in the afternoon, he would just train all afternoon. They did not have routines. Uh, but like the Russians, for instance, they would start every workout with, uh, calisthenics first. Then they would, and they did, uh, that was even done in uh, like Muscle Beach up until the 1950s, which is why you saw the physiques start to change in the 60s and the 70s when people started dropping hand balancing out of their physiques. You lost all those big, beautiful rib cages and the vacuums and a lot of the definition that you didn't, different biceps. You were seeing different things out of these people because they were doing a lot of acrobatic moves with straight arms and they trained their biceps with straight arms, doing levers and things like that. Um, do you, have you ever tried doing a lever? That, not even close. I've I've fooled around with it. I put my legs up on a. <laughs> I set the pull up bar up once, and did uh, I put the the reverse hyper? I've got a reverse hyper machine next to my pull up bar, and so I put my legs up on there and tried to do it. It was it was the ugliest thing I've ever seen. That takes the craziest amount of strength. You're talking levers from a pull up bar, right? Yep. It, yeah, it takes, it takes more crazy strength. strength. I mean, I was not really, even close. Your pecs, your pecs, your shoulders are the problem. <laughs> you're just lacking flexibility in it. And so the your range of motion and see, so you're selling yourself short. You have the strength to do them. It's you lack the flexibility to do them. 
And all of us have gotten so tight from doing these motions and going really, really heavy with them. We have just locked these knots in place. So they are really, as you know, how do you do your prehab and rehab, by the way, or your, just your rehab, that just the stuff you've been doing? Okay, so we're, right now what I'm doing is just tons and tons of, and, and, and I would have never probably done this 10 years ago, but tons of face pulls, tons of band work, all the stuff for opening, tons of mace work, the clubs, oh, all these things. This way, this oh, absolutely. Yeah. Yes. Oh, God. You guys have got to start opening your arms up, not just on cable crossovers. And, and when you do those, get in front of the police so they pull your arms back, mm-hmm. your shoulders back, not your arms back, but your sh- you got to roll your shoulders back, let it pull those back. So your starting position is set backwards and then kind of lean backwards and squeeze your pecs in. Yeah, doing tons of stuff like that just to get things open. And plus, because I work in an office, you're automatically bent over half the day. So you've got to reverse all that stuff. So I've been really working on reversing everything. I've been trying to do twice as much of pulling as I do pressing. Um, so that's it's just kind of been a whole mindset shift. And the hard thing for me is corrective exercise to me personally. It's hard because it's boring. So uh, I, I've got to try and mix things up and do things. I say, all right, you know, for my corrective exercise today, I'm going to do more mace work or I'm going to do some of these other things. But the cable stuff, it's not, it's very boring, but it, it's just so necessary to get back to where you should be. And then what happens is the lifts themselves, once you get, you know, I talked about my, switching the overhead press, the lift becomes the corrective exercise after a while. Yes. See what I'm trying to say? Yes. So that, that I said there's a season times when you have to do things to get back to where you should be or to correct a problem. But once that problem is corrected and you have good range of motion and you're doing things that exercise with good form, then I believe the exercise itself becomes corrective. So that's where I'm kind of headed. Is it's it's a lot of little things right now that's leading to the big thing, which I you know I'm going to go back to lots and lots of heavy overhead pressing. So, and I think that's a great idea. I think for people to think of their muscle fascia as kind of not so much a sausage casing, but sheets mm-hmm. like. Nice sheets that you would put on your bed, really like 600 thread count sheets. So if they're in the right position on your body and you're, you know, you have this tailored suit and you're wearing these sheets, if it's in the right position, it feels good. But if it's twisted around and it's stuck in the wrong spot and then you staple it in that spot because you need to be able to push your arm this way. And so you just keep stapling it, stapling it, stapling it. So now your arm's stuck to your body and by this fascia. And so you're going to have to do violent movements and stretch a lot, do a ton of massage. I don't do any of it in the gym. I do it all at home. Mm-hmm. And um, one, it, I find all kinds of different ways to do uh, like stuff that, I, you know, you see people doing these mobility experts. And I, I even saw um, uh, Matt Frazier, the, you know, the CrossFit James, games god. And he was bragging about his uh, his flexibility because he was sitting in a third world squat. And I was like, I was reading this thing on my phone as I was squatting down to pet my cats. And so I started getting into a third world squat to pet my cats and any dog or whatever, because one, they love it when you get on their level. And two, you need to work that. I mean, I used to pass out trying to tie my shoes and I only I competed at 181 I'm not that big but like my abs were so knotted up that I would I would literally pass out just (laughs) because I choked myself out trying to tie my shoes and um (laughs) that's ridiculous I mean it was kind of funny but then you know it's we all laugh and brag that like it's funny when you can't wipe your ass without cramping up except that it's not Mm -hmm. that's kind of like when I was drinking too much and I used to be like, oh, well, I'm in control of my addictions. That's a, not a funny joke to anybody but you. And the inflexibility thing, not funny to anybody but you. It's And it over time, these little pains that you've been taking Advil for and ignoring become incessant, nonstop pain. Cluster headaches, migraines, all from your traps being knotted up and stuck in the wrong spot because you never work shoulder flexibility. And uh, so you're just, 
you, all this pain that you think is supposed to come with old age isn't. It's just you not taking care of yourself. And because we've all given up on touching each other, so nobody's giving each other rub downs every day. And uh, like the ancient Greeks had a whole system of like rub downs and massage and oiling their skin and scraping it off. The Indians, every single one of them had to get a massage after their workouts. Mm -hmm. It was a rule. They would massage each other and then eat food. Sumo, all get massages and eat food after they after they train. What do we do? We drink fucking protein shakes and then go sit on the couch. It's <laughs> we have where's we've lost the message to the point where we don't even know what it is. And I was talking with Fairfax, uh, you know, our mutual friend, mm -hmm. about the fact that uh, certain gyms didn't have music in the fifties, and how I thought that it was just so ridiculous because it is contrary to the entire history of human. Human lift, uh, like humans have been lifting weights since at least 2600 BC. That's the oldest kettlebell I can find. And we know that the Indians living in that area always trained to music. And so did the Persians and the Greeks trained to music. Hippolyte Triot, when he started his gym in 1847, had an in-house band so that people could do group fitness and train to music. Like music's part of lifting. And then we had all these people like uh, uh, saying we had to train in silence and take it seriously. And it's like, this is shit is supposed to be fun. Mm -hmm. It's not supposed to be punching a clock. There's no grinding involved in this. This is your fucking hobby. Like, how are you grinding at a hobby? You don't grind at painting. You don't grind at juggling. Why? It's just, it drives me crazy. And so that is what we're doing that the old school guys aren't doing. Focused on all of the wrong details. And, you know, that's what I loved about what the old school guys did they didn't have to do corrective exercise because that was all part of their program. The lifts themselves would correct any kind of imbalances that we have today. You know, the flexibility yeah. they had to be able to do a, a, a handstand push-up, uh, they call it the press-up, to be able to do some of these things. They had all that flexibility. That was part of the, of the thing. And tiger bends. Tiger bends. Tiger Absolutely. Bends. I've, I've only seen God. one guy do that, and it's, it's one of the most incredible things you'll ever see. But it, that's the idea is getting back to some of this stuff. You know, for me personally, I got into such the heaviness of the weights that it got to the point where it's I'm missing all kinds of flexibility. I am locked into these positions, especially with the bench press. You know, the heavy, heavy bench press, I started noticing I am totally locked up during the day. And it's this idea that you're training the body to be in this position all the time. And so that's why I say, you know, for everybody's, I, I, hopefully everybody's doing some kind of corrective work. But like I said, when you're in a season like I am, you know, in your 50s, sometimes that's a longer thing. What I do for corrective work, the average guy wouldn't have to do. But I think everybody needs to be doing something just to overcome, you know, what I call tech neck and everything else, you know, the rounded shoulders. We all need to be doing something to counteract that. So it's and so important. that something is not spending money. Uh, it, I cannot impress that on people enough. You can't spend your way into being buff unless you're that asshole liver king and you're spending $10,000 a month on gear to be barely any bigger than I am, which is ridiculous since I've been off gear for a year. But like, like I mean, it's just, and I never really used that much to begin with. Like, and uh, because you don't need to. And so but everybody's focused on like, well, it's the sp supplements. I mean, it's got to be steroids. If it, it's not it, like, and I will point out that the old school guys were not natty by our standards. Like George Hackenschmidt was not natty. All those guys who trained in Russia, especially, uh, they were trained by this guy, Vladislav uh, Krajewski, who was the personal physician to Tsar Nicholas II. He was also the Coke dealer to Tsar Nicholas II. <laughs> Cocaine was so prevalent and so abused in, in St. Petersburg in that time that 75% of the homeless people had a cocaine addiction. Homeless people were addicted to cocaine. It was practically free. So like these guys, they were drinking something called Vin Mariani, which was called athlete's wine. It was Bordeaux wine and they would have three point, uh, uh, 372 milligrams of cocaine in each liter of wine. And these, and uh, like they were they were drinking it in the middle of lifts. It was so they were coked up and they were taking anything they could. They were taking strychnine they, because that helps with performance. If you take it in a very, very specific dose, I mean, they took anything they could take because they wanted an edge because that meant 
more money and that meant more prestige and that meant more women or men or whoever. And so like, uh, this was not about trying to get most jacked. This was about trying to be the coolest artist on vaudeville and, uh, and live in that high life, literally and figuratively. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, it, it's just so interesting to see history and how all those things play out. Um, it's <laughs> that's a whole other subject because, again, I, I used to tell people you don't have to do steroids. You know, I've never done steroids before. You know, you can be as strong as you want to be. It just depends on what your goals are. You know, you can take it as far as you want to go, and then for people that want to take it to that next level, that's a whole other discussion. But I find so many people use that as an excuse not to do anything. Like, well, yes. I can't do scary, so I'm not gonna well, no, do what you can with what you've got. That that's that's the whole point. And you talked about genetics and everything else. Everybody's got some ability, and so you gotta do with what you have, you know. What, but this isn't about like a, so Doug Hepburn was a club foot. And yeah, he was absolutely. the strongest presser on the planet during his life. I mean, he was a literal god. And the list goes on and on and on. Arthur Dandurand was also an ad- adaptive lifter. There were lots of adaptive lifters. Arthur Dandurand's forearms were bigger than my upper arms. And he was an adaptive lifter. Like, this wasn't about genetics. It was about people doing as much as they could possibly do. Like, um, so the guy who was brought in after uh, Hackenschmidt was unable to win the World Weightlifting Championships was this guy, uh, Sergei Yelisev. And he was 5'8", 205. And so he wasn't a huge guy. And he, he grew up in the sticks, so he had never lifted barbells before. He only trained with a, with a heavy kettlebell. And so when he, when he was invited to go train in St. Petersburg, he started running up and down hills for 12 miles a day in lead line shoes. And then he was lifting this kettlebell constantly. And they, and he and his, he and his brothers like invented all these crazy bits of equipment that they could train with, but they just trained with whatever they had so that when they got to the next place that had great training equipment, they could use it. But then when they had a competition, like, so if you had to train or go from St. Petersburg to Paris, this was not jumping on a flight and going there. And so you couldn't train up to the competition. This was, you trained and then you took a train for three weeks where you couldn't train at all. And you you were eating whatever you had on the train. And like, it, this was a very different time. And so you can't even compare yourself to the records of those old time people because they were using very different implements, like barbells that didn't rotate. They were training in very different ways. And they were also, when they were going to competitions, they were doing it in a very different way. This, it was, it was a way to gather attention so that you could go to the next level. It was not like you were trying to prove you were the best to the world. It, they, they knew that anybody could get beaten at any time, which is something else that everybody loses. When I broke that record, it wasn't because I thought I was the strongest person on the planet. The strongest people on the planet don't compete because they don't have anything to prove. They never have, and they never will. That's a good point. And you know, another thing, just uh, I don't want to get too much off because we'll have to, we're going to have to bring you on again because we got so much we didn't get to, is that, you know, a lot of guys couldn't handle the implements that they had in those days because of the thick handles. Oh, yeah. And some of them were crazy thick because some of those guys had really big hands. Yeah. And so, but just you, you got the implement that they had, you know, like you're saying, you didn't get to choose. You didn't get to personally design everything. You know, you went you where you went. What they had is what they had. And so and their it made a big competitions difference. Were like you didn't get the events beforehand, and you would pick some events, and I would pick some events, which is how you and I used to train. Didn't you train that way when you mm-hmm. had partners in high school? Absolutely. I picked the first exercise, you picked the next yep. one. The other guy picks the next yep. one. So important. Um, let me get a couple more questions. I said we definitely will have you back. We'd love to have you back. Um, what are your recommendations for modern trainees trying to achieve the look, the classic, you know, look of the old school? athletes uh okay so the number one thing that everybody needs to start doing is pullovers as we discussed this is an you're just over a a, you're going to be cross bench so not with the bench vertical on your back you want that extra stretch so and you're just coming over with the dumbbell and then coming back down as getting as much of a stretch as you possibly can um, I even have gone so far as there's a, I have a really fun gym. And so we have this basketball game that you can do with medicine balls where you can go back, touch the, have you seen mm, that thing? 
I have not seen it. I, I know what you're talking oh, about. Okay, yeah. so it's like it's like a one of those basketball games where you shoot at the at the hoop, but it's got a little pad on it with a with a target on it, and so you can do medicine ball throws. That's at awesome. This thing. Oh, and I've been doing that, and it's it's helped loosen up my arms. I know this arm looks disgusting, but it you should have seen it two years ago. I mean, I basically had my arm turned sideways. It, it's been on sideways for two years, and I tried to train through it, but it, funny how that doesn't work. And so. But the pullovers have really helped. I also think, uh, and I don't even know what these are called. They're claps. So you start with your hands in front. You open up, go overhead, out, and back to the front. So they're, and I do them in four counts like this. I did them for years and years back in the day, and I completely forgot about them until a couple of months ago. And my God, they make your shoulders feel good. You get a great pump. So, like, if you're going to the beach and you want your shoulders to look on a bean, do 104 count uh, hand claps before you go. You will look amazing. It just, it's one of those things where it doesn't seem like it's something you need to do, but you've got to open up your chest. It's like, it, it's like you're opening yourself up to new opportunities. And the tighter you get, I feel like the tighter your mind is. You know what I mean? Absolutely. So, I really think the pullover is something everybody needs to start doing. Also, squatting ass to grass is essential. And this is from a guy who set a world record doing the goofy powerlifting West Side squat. Let's stop with that. It uh, It's not the way to strength. I mean, it is a way that you can demonstrate strength in a goofy way. But having done it myself, I don't think that it's a legitimate test of strength or yeah. demonstration of strength. Let me ask you this. Throw, throw a couple of things in the mix. One, you can add a, a, like a jumping jack into that. They used to call them, I think they're called seal jacks. I could be okay. wrong, but you're talking about with the hand clap. So then you're throwing in a little okay. bit. If you were doing a warm up, you need to warm up fast. You're getting, you know, killing two birds with one stone, doing the lower body and jumping upper body. Jumping jacks are phenomenal. But like doing it as a seal, things. like you're talking about taking the arms out and doing those like that where you're clapping. Um, what do you. If you had to choose, and you're talking about somebody who's starting lifting today, front squat or back squat? Front squat. Right on. You know, I try and tell you, you're going to build so much abdominal strength. All these things happen, especially when you don't use a belt. Um, And also, I want to tell, can you tell people just a little bit that are freaked out about doing pullovers? There's a lot of talk about people laying long ways on the bench because they're freaked out they're going to hurt themselves if they do a pullover crossways on the bench. Can you just kind of there's give a, a much yeah, there's a much better chance that you'll dislocate both your shoulders when they're locked into place on either side of a weird bench than when you're able to move around and flexible and loose. You can stretch more. There's so many benefits you're going to get from cross bench as opposed to I wouldn't even bother doing them. You'll probably end up hurting yourself or falling off the bench. If you're not going to get any of the benefits of it if you do it. I, I don't even know what you would call them. There's a lot of people that are doing them. They just put their knees up and they're doing it that way, but you're not really getting a good stretch. So people get freaked out about a lot of stuff today. People are, I don't want to say, you know, you, you take a risk whatever you do. You take a risk when you get in your car. But it just seems like the exercise police are out there today and they're really worried that people are going to hurt themselves at the slightest thing. And so... I just throw that out there as a disclaimer. If I could throw one other recommendation to, uh, to every lifter, not just beginners, don't be afraid to make an ass of yourself. And I don't mean to be that guy to do a pull down to your belly button because God help us. Who knows why those people do that? But like my favorite way to the way that I go, uh, like I do my cardio, I walk to the gym and, uh, or I jog to the gym and I walk on the curb because I realized I have, I have always had terrible balance. I couldn't even walk a line sober and I could stand on one foot or anything like that, which is pretty funny when you're doubling 675 on the squat, but you can't stand on one foot. So now I jog on the, uh, on the, on the, uh, curb as I go to as I go to the gym, which has to look hilarious. I'm a jacked 46 year old dude, like jogging down the curb and like falling off, and you know I'm having like nin- doing Ninja Warrior in my head. But I don't care. Like I'm out there having fun and I'm doing my own thing. And I've always been in my own head, and so it didn't really bother me what anybody thought. But you have got to be open to doing new weird shit because we're doing the same movement patterns over and over and over again and losing. I mean, this is just two axes. Like 
There's lots of other shit. Do arm yep. swings, arm circles it should be the way you start your day every day. Just do 10 arm circles one way, 10 arm circles the other day, then carry on with your day. But if you open up your chest, you breathe better, you feel better, uh, you think better, everything is better. Yeah, that's awesome. Well, final couple questions, okay? Okay. We're and I really would. Would you be willing to come back? Absolutely. We, we'd so love. Much fun. We'd love to have you come I'm back. Sorry for the uh, if the if the ice cream truck is driving you crazy. There's nothing I could do about it. Sweet tooth lives outside. Well, I can't even hear have it. You so, see? Oh, cool. So we're we're good. Um, where can people find out more about you? Your resources. You've got a ton of stuff on Plague of Strength. And is there anything else that you want to share? So those two questions there. Uh, okay. So. Uh, the easiest way to get to my books and stuff like, I mean, you can go to the website, but sometimes it's hard to navigate. I have a link tree set up in my profile on Instagram. So if you just go to at plague of strength on Instagram, uh, you, you just go into my profile, click that. You can see where you can get my books easily. You can get to my YouTube. Uh, I have a new podcast, which I need. Oh, I have linked in that thing. Uh, it's called uh prize fighters, circus freaks and gangsters. And I, I wanted to be a history teacher growing up. So uh, that's what I'm trying to, to work towards. And I'm teaching history to people with my partner, Greta Harden, who's a food historian. We're teaching 19th century history, which is all of the formative years, all these old school strongmen. I wanted to teach everybody how they trained and how they lived and how they ate because everybody thinks that their food was good and it was not. <laughs> so that's why I got a food historian. And um, so we're going through old movies, uh, movies that, that cover the 19th century and teaching history through that. So we started with Gangs New York and then went into Warrior, the TV show. And so we're covering Kung Fu and Chinese history and all kinds of fun stuff, Bruce Lee. So um, that's awesome. And I uh, prize fighters, circus freaks and gangsters. It's on uh, Spotify and Apple Play. Uh, and then my website is Plague of Strength. And my Instagram, I post pretty much every day. I try to do really inspirational stuff. And everybody's always, we grew up in the era where Everything had to be done as hard as a thing could be done. Uh, and if it was possible to do it harder, do it harder. And we got into, then we turned into the extreme guys in the 90s and everything had to be super extreme. And um, so I'm trying to get more positive because that was another thing we lost. We lost the positivity of lifting. Everybody started backbiting each other and form not seeing everybody. And th nobody cheered anybody else on. I mean, you go to lifting meets and it's miserable. You go to CrossFit meets, and I mean, people get laid after CrossFit meets. Everybody's beautiful. They're strong as hell, and everybody in the lifting world shits on those people, and it's like, they're doing it right. They're having fun. They're fit. They're strong as hell, and they're strong at everything. So, um, yeah, Plague of Strength, Prize Fighter, Circuit Streets, and Gangsters. Do your arm circles, and also watch my man on Go Big, because that episode was amazing. <laughs> That's awesome. Well, I want to thank our guest, Jamie Lewis, for investing in all of our listeners today. Thank you, Jamie, so much for sharing with us. Thank you so much for having me on, and I'm glad I bought this new webcam for this thing. <laughs> That's awesome. Thanks again to our guest today, Jamie Lewis, and I also want to thank our sponsors, ZionMissionaryChurch.net, NeuropowerSource.com, our podcast producer, Drew Kiespert, video director, JoLynn Thomas, head of talent relations, Mr. Fairfax Hackley. Be sure to rate us and subscribe to the Pressing Limits podcast and follow us on Instagram for the latest episodes. For more ways to watch and listen to this podcast, check out the Pressing Limits podcast website.